Well, our final speaker of the day is a gentleman that a number of you have uh, heard before, and I've had a number of people that are saying, we stay just for this because we're looking forward to hearing from Dr. Barry Flinchbaum. Uh, Dr. Flinchbaum and I have known each other a long time. I have to say that he's less of a man than he was uh, the last time I saw him. Uh, he also has uh, cut into the profits of the tobacco industry a bit, and perhaps he'll explain both of those to you right now. He is a person who honestly, his position at Kansas State University in one of the most powerful agricultural areas of the country as far as politics, had a tremendous impact on farm policy for many years, and probably the greatest impact was in the 1990s and beyond. So would you please welcome the Emeritus Professor, Dr. Barry Fletchbar. Can you all hear in the back? Do you want to hear in the back? <laughs> it's good to be back. It's been two years. Some things have changed. Uh, Ken Root has less hair and it's fatter. And I've heard that uh, he's been in the pumpkin business. And this can only happen to Ken. He pays big bucks from, for seeds from the largest pumpkin growing in the United States. And he produced a tremendous crop of many pumpkins. Yeah. The only farmer I know that was, had more difficulty than Ken has had is Terry Cassins. If you remember him, he was here when I was here two years ago. Uh, when he was a graduate student at KU, which that's part of the problem right there. <laughs> that other institution of lower learning in Kansas State in the state of Kansas. Terry's the only one I, farmer I knew that couldn't get rabbits to breed. <laughs> uh, so, Ken, you can try that if you'd like. That's the one that makes that thing work? That's the okay. one that makes it work. Thank you. It's good you're here, son, or we'd be in trouble given our equipment uh, abilities. There's a way to discover or to explain or account for your day. And I've been here with you since 8 o'clock this morning. I don't know how many economists you have heard from. Too damn many, frankly. And there's an old adage that uh, if you have two economists in one room, you have a minimum of three opinions. And the fact that Cole was here um, certainly makes that statement absolutely correct. Now, I have gotten older, by the way, and you will notice that I don't have a cigar. After 54 years, I have a cardiologist who said no more cigars. I thought about shooting him. <laughs> he also told me no more red meat, and I told him he was full of shit right then and there. <laughs> and that he was being paid by the chicken industry. <laughs> and I have some steak. It doesn't hurt me. But I got this birthday card, which fits perfectly to, for today. 
the mess in Washington that we all love to talk about. I'm sure these people from other countries that are here uh, are getting tired about hearing about this mess, but uh, it says good news and bad news on your birthday. The bad news is they're putting a tax on sex now. The good news is you will be getting a refund. I'm going to leave this for Steve. He's been married three years, I think, and has three kids. So you need this card, son. Spigots turn on, they also turn off, you know. <laughs> it's an amazing time to be an economist. Certainly in the United States, it's an amazing time to be an ag policy specialist. It's an amazing time to work on a farm bill. It's also damn frustrating. I turn off the news and I go to bed and I say to myself, well, it can't get any worse. Then I get up the next morning and turn on the TV and it has gotten worse overnight. It may have reached a low point this week in terms of just pure meanness, and I'm not going to talk about gun control. I know nothing about it. But the pure meanness of the National Rifleman's Association using a political ad on the president's two young girls. The history of this country from George Washington has been, you don't attack the president's kids. Now that's how damn low we've gotten in this country. And I'm embarrassed. Now to be fair, then the president goes on the air and uses kids for political reasons also. NRA and the president both need spanked for doing that because they're acting like children and using children. I've got that off my chest now. I grew up 75 miles north of Washington. I remember the first president of the United States that I laid eyes on. I was in the first grade, I was six years old. I had my old maid aunt, and that was an appropriate term in those days, as my teacher in a one-room schoolhouse. And the President of the United States came to town to campaign on the back of a train. He came out on the back of the train, I assume this was staged, and some old farmer shouted, give him hell, Harry. And he said, I don't give them hell, I just tell the truth about the opposition and they think it's hell. We certainly could use him today. It is fashionable to argue about all this economic uncertainty and how the American economy is not very productive and how bad these economic times are. That's fashionable. It's also wrong. It's not economic uncertainty. It's political uncertainty. Now that chart shows the gross domestic product of the United States. And the last number that should go up there for the last quarter where we actually have sufficient data is 3%. So the American economy is growing at 3%. 
Well, compare that historically through that chart. That's certainly not good, but neither are we down below the line. We've got 3% growth. Interest rates are at three and a quarter. Everybody here says they're going up. I agree, but I think it's gonna be very slow. Inflation is at 2.3. Unemployment's at 7.8. This is not an economy that is in recession, or certainly depression. The Economist magazine argues that there is roughly four and a half to five trillion dollars of loose change floating around in the American economy. That should be of interest to people at an investment convention. This four and a half to five trillion is uninvested, unloaned, only short term, 24 hours, for example. Why? Now, I'm not going to ask you this, but I'll make you a bet that even at this conference, most of you are holding more cash than you've ever held. Why? Now, Rogers told you the thing to do with that cash is to buy Iowa farmland. I don't disagree with that, especially under those circumstances, as he said, if you have the cash. Why should you invest? You have any idea what your taxes are going to be in 2013? You have any idea what your energy costs are going to be? You have any idea what your health care costs are going to be? You have any idea what rules and regulations Washington's going to come up with? How do you plan? I am firmly convinced if we got our political act together, if Washington got its political act together as well as Des Moines has gotten Iowa's political act together, and incidentally, I'll trade you governors and ag secretaries, if you would like, and some of you know me well know that's pretty personal because the Kansas governor's a former student of mine. I didn't teach him enough, evidently. <laughs> or he's forgotten it. Now, and he's heard me say this, so this isn't anything new. But I'm firmly convinced if we would just get our political act together, we could take that shot to 5% within the year. Because we would be comfortable investing. It is not economic uncertainty. Almost none of it is economic uncertainty. It is political uncertainty. Now, the, the next chart, I don't use many charts, but you gotta use a few to be a legitimate economist these days. This chart tells a great story. Greatness measured in how much it explains. 
not how good or bad it is. I use this chart in almost every speech I have for years. Now, what is so interesting about this chart is that our budget deficit is increasing annually more than a trillion dollars a year. To use the favorite political term today, that is not sustainable. Something is going to happen that will rectify this. Now, I don't bring partisan politics into economics. But this is interesting. It defies conventional wisdom. On the far left, all that red ink, that's Papa Bush. He just got out of the hospital. It looks like he's doing fine. I loved his comment when he said, don't get the harps out yet. <laughs> then you move to the right, and you start with the red ink again. That's Junior, George W. Bush. The biggest line on there, 209, I believe it is, is George W. Bush. And then the three lines after that is Barack Obama. But there are four years there of black ink. Remember him? What do you remember about him? <laughs> Someone this morning said, or maybe it was on TV last night, no, uh, David Cole said it, I think, on the, the, there was a presidential history show on last night, and mentioned the president that had the most separate problems next to Clinton. And I can't remember who it was. Warren G. Harding, I believe. But anyhow, you go to the Clinton Library in uh, Little Rock, and you'll see this chart. You won't see anything about Monica. This is the issue of our times. This is the reason we didn't get a farm bill. I began working on farm bills in 1968 with Earl Bucks. And I've never seen the overall economic situation or the budget affect the farm bill more than it's affected what was to be the 2012 bill and now hopefully will be the 2013 bill. But going back to 1968 or even back to 1948, when I made my first trip to Washington, I've never seen the nation's capital more dysfunctional, more mean-spirited, more partisan, more downright unworkable than it is now. And this is the issue of our times. To show you how dysfunctional things are, they all knew, and I don't want anybody to ask me any partisan questions because take your pick. They're both incompetent. If you want to argue 49.5 versus 50.5, okay, but they're, it's damn near per equal. They knew they couldn't go over that fiscal cliff, and we all said, I made speeches. Midnight on December 31 was going to be a great evening. They are so incompetent, they knew they had 24 hours before the stock market opened, so they postponed the damn thing to midnight on January 1. 
another 24 hours. I had a unique privilege on Tuesday. I made a speech about monetary and fiscal policy. And Senator Moran from Kansas was in the audience, and there was a staff member from every one of the Kansas congressional offices. I burnt their butts good and told them to take it home to their bosses. They needed it. So what did we do on January 1? We kicked the can down the road for two months. We did not solve the fiscal cliff. We are still subject to $1.2 trillion of sequestration on March 1. We increased taxes on those who have an adjusted gross taxable income of more than $400,000 or 450000 if it's a married couple. As far as agriculture is concerned, we, do, we did do one thing that has decreased some uncertainty, and that is we supposedly permanently fixed the estate tax. I would remind you that nothing is permanently fixed as long as the Congress is in session. We didn't increase taxes enough. to solve the problem. So we basically kicked the can down the road. The Congress and the President has created this political uncertainty that has brought economic, or rather anemic, growth to the economy. The one sector that seemed to not be affected was agriculture. Last fall, they had the irresponsibility or the audacity to leave town, not pass a farm bill, in the depths of a 60-year drought. That doesn't meet the definition of the word irresponsibility. I don't know what does. Yet what did we do in November? The status quo. The president was reelected by a five million vote margin. Democrats gained two seats in the Senate and eight seats in the House. Now, I had an old farmer friend back in Rossville, Kansas, used to say, when you run dogs, you deserve to get beat. And when you look who ran for the Senate in Missouri and Indiana, they were dogs and they got beat. So evidently, we're not convinced it's bad enough yet to kick the bombs out. Now, there's two lessons right here I want you all to try to remember. You're investing in farmland. We passed a farm bill in 1938 called the Agricultural Adjustment Act. We amended it permanently in 1949. Every farm bill cycle I hear why don't we repeal that old, archaic farm bill? That's called the permanent legislation. And the 2008 farm bill was a set of temporary amendments to the permanent legislation. When they expired on September 30th, we automatically reverted back to the permanent legislation. I will guarantee you without any shadow of a doubt, if that law was not on the books, there would be no farm programs today. There would be no CRP. 
they wouldn't let it expire. But they couldn't do that. They were fully prepared to go beyond January 1. and let the Secretary of Agriculture operate in no man's unknown land. And then the press discovered that if they didn't do something, milk was going to be six to eight bucks a gallon. Because milk in the 1938 Agriculture Adjustment Act is supported at $52 a hundredweight, 100% of parity. And all of a sudden, we started to hear about the dairy cliff, remember? It actually took on much more importance than the fiscal cliff. Those congressmen certainly didn't have enough of guts to go home and face the consumer with milk at $8 a gallon because of their incompetence. And lo and behold, all we did was take the 2008 Farm Bill, strike out 2012, and put in 2013, and <clears throat> it went right straight through the Congress. So we've kicked the can down the road once again. It's painful. You all can tell by the color of my jacket, shirt, where I come from. Um, we take care of Texas for the rest of the Big 12, you know. Um, but I come from the home of the former ranking minority on the Senate Ag Committee. He and the chair lady, Mrs. Stabenow from Michigan, decided more than a year ago that they would put farmers first and partisan politics second, which is rare today. Going to the bathroom in that building is partisan. There's a slightly dirtier way to explain that, but my wife won't let me use it. Let your imagination roll. They work together. Pat even refused to go to Michigan and campaign against her, which irritated the hell out of Mitch McConnell, the minority leader. But we got a farm bill, and we got a good one, and we got it passed. Veto proof, two thirds. Can it still be done? Yes. But you have to have a statesman and a states lady to do it. January 1, 2013, all of that good work just disappeared. Because anything that occurred in the 112th Congress died automatically. And now we're in the 113th. On the House side, they passed a similar bill. But it never made it to the floor. And it expired at the end of the 112th Congress. So basically, we begin anew. And we will likely pass a farm bill at midnight on September 30th, 2013, when the current law now expires. I told the Commodity Classic in Kansas Tuesday that the state of Kansas will have less influence on this farm bill now than any farm bill since I've been in Kansas and I've been there 42 years. 
That is basically true for the whole Midwest and Iowa. Now, you have the Secretary of Agriculture, but ag secretaries don't write farm bills. Congress writes a farm bill. Now, the Midwest does have Congressman Peterson. He's the ranking minority on the House bill, and he, he may be the most influential congressman in the country on dairy policy. That's likely to continue. Although Speaker Boehner just detests the Peterson bill. There's two tough, crusty old congressmen, and we're going to have to have a meeting of the minds. But they're old timers, and they understand how you compromise and do things. I argued for years that the biggest problem we face in agriculture in terms of politics and policy is that we love to wash our dirty linen in public. We behave like we're a majority when we are certainly a minority. 80% of the farm sales in this country now, farm commodity sales, not farmland, come from roughly 300,000 producers. That's the definition of a minority, and the first job a minority has is to put together a majority if they're going to get anything done. What happened in the Senate that got my senator kicked out as the ranking minority and Senator Cochran from Mississippi put in, it's very simple. There's been an age-old battle between cotton, peanuts, rice, versus wheat, feed grains, and oil seeds. And Cochran made the comment that Roberts can learn to eat rice now. So it's that old commodity, what we call, frankly, pissing contest. But that's not the real reason it happened. I swear to God, my Republican friends have a death wish with these dogs they dig up and the dumb stuff they do. The Republican Party in the Senate adopted term limits on committee assignments. And the Democrats didn't. Guess who won that battle? So Senator Cochran was knocked off of the Appropriations Committee as the ranking minority because he was term limited. He had the seniority on the Ag Committee. So the minority leader, Senator McConnell from Kentucky, automatically appointed him as the ranking minority replacing Pat Roberts. There is no question that this next farm bill will be a southern-oriented farm bill. I'm going down there in a few weeks. I've joked that this may be my last trip. What they prefer, they want to go back to the old target price plan, the marketing loan. There's even some support for the old non-recourse loan that actually is in the permanent legislation in 1938. I'm going to ask them, what is it you don't get? Now, is there anybody in here that doesn't understand that writing a revenue safety net is more protective of risk 
than writing a target price program. Does anybody in here not get that revenue provides more protection than price? In Kansas, we would say, if you believe that, you are a KU graduate. Now, here, I guess it's a University of Iowa graduate, right? Is that about right? How much trouble am I in now? Is there a few of them in here? Well, but that's the guy's paying the bill. We're not going to talk about that. Now, why is it those Southerners can't get that? Why is it they say that crop insurance don't work in the South? That bill that went up in flames when the 112th Congress ended had the most protection in any farm bill for crop insurance in the history of the country. It's gone. And I need to remind you that crop insurance is going to be an issue in the battle over cutting government spending. The Wall Street Journal, which I call the National Enquirer of the Business World, has discovered it and likes nothing better than to put misinformation on the front page. Uh, the Des Moines Register, the world's greatest newspaper by its own admission, <laughs> has discovered it also. And what is at issue here is how much risk should we protect? If we could answer that question, these other questions would be easier to solve. We obviously don't want to make agriculture risk proof. But I'm getting damn tired of hearing. Well, you had this record drought, but net farm income's actually going up a bit because of crop insurance. Duh. Isn't that why you bought it? Isn't that why you have crop insurance? Isn't that why I have my house insured? So if it burns down, I'm still economically intact. God forbid we had this huge drought and crop insurance worked. Now, why can't those Southerners in the Wall Street Journal get that? The reason is they don't want them. Now, the next issue on this farm bill, and this actually was initiated by my own congressman, who I frankly don't claim. I call him number 434. There are 435 congressmen. You all want to know who 435 is? Michelle Bachman from Minnesota. If she had a broomstick, she could fly faster than a 747. <laughs> I didn't call her any names, I just told the truth. <laughs> My congressman introduced a bill to take food stamps out of the farm bill. Now, we finally are having a meeting. And I'm going to see if I can explain it to him. Food stamps, nutrition programs, WIC, school lunch, 85% of USDA's budget. If that is taken out and put in health and human services under my good friend Catherine, Kathleen Sebelius, and she would, could run it, she 
you know how. USDA is left with a budget that's much lower than many sub-cabinet level agencies. This will be the beginning of the end of the United States Department of Agriculture. We will move conservation programs and the Forest Service to Interior, over there with that BML land. We will take all the pesticide regulations, et cetera, and put it in EPA. Are you ready for that? We will take meat inspection, as we have done with seafood inspection, and put it over in health and human services. And your friend Wilsack can come back home because he won't have a job. That's how stupid this is. And it's coming from an ag state congressman. Boom. They did. If we take all these feeding programs out of agriculture, there will be no more farm bills. There are less than 50 states, or 50, yeah, 50 congressional districts. that you could call rural. In order to pass anything, you have to build it to a majority. Now, a lady said to me the other night, she said, you know, Flinch Paul, I've, I remember when you were just a kid. And you used to be positive. Well, I said, I still am. She said, you, I sure can't tell it. And I looked at her and I said, well, I was born an optimist and I'll die an optimist, but I better not die tomorrow. And she's a delightful lady, so I, I just had to tell her this story. Uh, this 70-year-old couple were getting ready for bed and that hits home real personable, so I gotta be careful. And he was laying in bed, and she had taken off all her clothes and hadn't put on her nightgown yet. And she was looking in the mirror, and she said, oh my God, I'm ugly. Fat, everything's sagging, just terrible. It's depressing. You've got to say something positive to me. Oh dear, he said, you have damn near perfect eyesight. <laughs> now, Ken, you can get away with that. Steve, you better not try. <laughs> it's almost like it kind of fits the same story of this old boy with, he had six children, and they, he loved to brag about it. And he was in his 70s, and he... He would go, they'd go to parties and he would introduce her as the mother of six. And she got, frankly, damn tired of that. And one night he said, it's time for us to go home, mother of six. And she said, well, you can go on home. I'm not ready to go yet, father of four. <laughs> So you best be careful. <laughs> now let me close this, and then I'll take a couple questions. Let me close this with a little more in-depth discussion of what we have to do in order to get our fiscal house in order. Because if we don't get our fiscal house in order, we won't get a farm bill. And if we don't get our fiscal house in order, we're in deep trouble. 
Now, without a doubt, our fiscal mess will be solved this year, either by the political system or the marketplace. Time has arrived. If we default, now get this, default and the fiscal cliff are not related. Here's a place I agree with the president, it's very obvious. The debt ceiling concerns spending that's already been made and the bills have come due. The fiscal cliff is to get the budget balanced. They are separate issues. Now, it is time for this president to stand up, and show some guts and lead. I'm firmly convinced, I'm not a lawyer, I have a daughter, a niece, and a son-in-law, all three are lawyers, and I have a son that's a veterinarian, so I'm protected medically and legally. <laughs> the 14th Amendment allows the President of the United States, gives him full authority to eliminate the debt seal. Just Go home tonight, get out your Constitution and read it. And if they refuse to cooperate with him, he needs to do it to save the economy. We cannot default. If we default, who's going to buy our bonds? How hard will interest rates have to go to get them to buy? Defaulting says we are a third world nation that can't pay our bills. What do you think the dollar's going to be worth? What are we going to buy fuel with? Will oil continue to be sold in dollar terms? And I agree with Jim, you know, I don't see how Bernanke can print any more money. Legally he can, but we're on QE3 and that's got to stop one of these days. So this is a no-brainer, we've got to do it. And, they, and here's what else I would do if I was the president. The work's already done on the budget problem. We don't need any more committees, we don't need any more hearings, we don't need any more speeches. Solutions have been provided. The president appointed a committee chaired by Alan Simpson and, um, what's Bowles' first name? Erskine Bowles. Go read it. It's very straightforward. Simpson wrote it. It balances the budget through cutting spending 70% of, of the balance comes from cutting spending and 30% from tax increase. The President of the United States should send that bill to Boehner, to that Congress, to those right-wing nut freshmen and say, you pass it. The Senate will pass it. Republicans will vote for it in the Senate. And the president will sign it, and we will live happily ever after, basically. This is not that difficult. And some of you may be saying for the first time, by damned up, there's an economist that's providing some answers and isn't saying if on the other hand. It isn't economics. 
It isn't complexity. It's the lack of political guts. On the part of the speaker, the majority and minority leaders in the House, the majority and minority leaders in the Senate, and the President of the United States. All just reelected. Do it. Churchill used to say, and my Canadian, British slash African friend, you love Churchill as much as I do. He used to say those Americans, they always do the right thing. And then he would grin and he would say, after they have spent a tremendous amount of time doing the wrong thing, the time is up. We cannot afford to do the wrong thing anymore. So write your congressman, pass Simpson Bowles. Thank you. Doctor, thank you very much.